Hello everyone, can you hear me? Great. Okay, so we have 30 people, I guess um, people will arrive later. So today we will talk about accelerated uh, ray tracing. Specifically, we will talk about uh, a space partition technique. There are a lot of space partition techniques, but we, are, we will talk about well, one of those. And um, yeah, and, and I will show you a couple of algorithms that I, that I really love, that they are like really, really nice. And, uh, and remember, this could be, this could be uh, useful for you if you want to achieve the bonus points for the ray tracing assignment. Okay, so uh, we had a couple of uh, spending stuff the, the past lecture, this, uh, the sign up for face to face. I hope everybody is already doing that. And um, yeah, I think that's it. So also today's lecture, uh, it will be a bit shorter because I need to give you time at the end of the of, of the lecture to answer the evaluation. Remember the teaching evaluation. I'm sure some of you already answer, but uh, yeah, not everybody. Okay. So let me start the presentation. Give me a second. Yeah. I'm sharing my screen. You, you can see my screen, right? Good. Okay. So we were talking about the other day. Well, these are the learning goals for today. Space partition techniques. Specifically, we will talk about uh, an algorithm called uh, ray stepping, or sometimes it's also called ray marching, although there, there is another algorithm that specifically is called ray marching. But yeah, ray stepping, ray marching and also incremental intersections. So yeah, you will see that some, it's, it's really nice. But again, ray marching, I probably will talk about that maybe next uh, next lecture. So this is ray stepping, and they're very similar. Okay, so we were, we were talking about uh, dip of field, motion blur, and all these cool effects that we, we can do with path tracing, right? And we've, we've seen that, um, Almost every realistic effect that we can produce with a real camera, it is kind of achievable in, in path tracing, just sending a lot of rays, right? And, and yeah, that is that is basically what we do, right? We just send a lot of rays and we can get motion blur, dip of field, glossy reflections, uh, ray tracing, glossy ray tracing, ray tracing, and things like that. And eventually, if you want like a very, very quality image, you just need to increase the number of rays of course, right? But however, it, it is very expensive, right? So here is an example in which maybe I have a, a specific pixel, right? That it needs to uh, uh, travel along my scene and, uh, sorry, yeah, a, a specific pixel that I'm sampling, right? So I need to shoot many rays, right? Because I'm probably rendering indirect lighting, right? Because it's a path tracing, so I'm maybe like multiplying by all my comp uh, computation is multiplied by 10 because I'm also uh, uh, getting these random rays that are going everywhere, sampling other parts of the environment. I'm maybe adding soft shadows, depth of field, motion blur, and telesing. And, and in the end, I can have 100,000 rays per pixel, right? So, yeah, path tracing is very expensive. So I was telling you the other day that uh, the, the final image that you can produce with the, the, literally the last example that is on, on, at the end of Peter Schur's book. If you render that image in a very high quality, right? I mean, if you boost the number of samplings that you do for path tracing, um, <laughs> uh, deep, deep of field, depth of field, uh, and um, obviously if you increase the resolution and things like that, you can have your computer just working for half an hour. So the thing is, the most expensive part, or one of the most expensive parts of ray tracing is that for every ray that we are sending, right, we need to check if it's intersecting or not with basically all the objects in the scene. That is, that is what makes ray tracing so expensive. Or, or, or again, it's one of the reasons that makes ray tracing more expensive. Of course, if we just get rid of all those fancy effects, it will be, it will be cheaper, right? But in the end, for every ray we send, right, and if we have one million triangles in our scene, every new ray I shoot, I need to check if that ray is basically intersecting with one 
million triangles, it, it is just impressively expensive. So we're gonna have something like this. We have we could have a scene in which a lot of a lot of uh, parts of the scene are basically empty, right? So there are no objects there. So if I if I shoot a ray from in this direction, I should I should, right? The ideal is I should not get any intersection at all, right? And I just need to get probably the background color, right? Remember the the background usually is something that is defined by the user. We can just set it as white, black, or whatever, or, or we can use a um, a texture, for example, to simulate uh, the uh, the sky, right? Um, by the way, that is something that is actually done in, in your ray tracing. Peter Shirley uh, creates a, a very simple equation in which he defines the background as like a gradient color between black, sorry, between white and blue, and yeah, it seems like a nice sky, right? So that will be the ideal, right? However, with a naive ray tracing, this ray, right, needs to check if any of the objects in the scene is basically colliding with, with it, right? And we can have something sim simple with a couple of spheres. You already see the math. The math of intersecting a ray with a sphere is actually very, is very cheap, right? It's not that bad because we don't even need to compute the intersection just by measuring. Remember that there is like a distance D that we had in, in our equations. If you compute the distance D, which is basically the distance between the center of the sphere and the ray, right? Like a orthogonal distance. If that distance is larger than the radius of the sphere, it means that you're missing the sphere. So the spheres are actually not access, uh, as expensive, right? The problem is that in real life, implicit spheres are not as common, right? We have complex shapes and 3D models that are usually created by triangles. So if you have a dragon like this one, um, I think the dragon that I've, I've shown you in, on the images have, yeah, around half a million triangles. The original one has way more. Uh, this this is one of, of like like very famous models in, in computer graphics, along with the an armadillo and, and the bunny uh, from Stanford Bunny. And yeah, I think I think the original file, because it was created with a, a laser uh, scanner, has, I don't know, like three million triangles or something like that, right? So imagine every time I send a new ray, either if it's a primary ray or a secondary ray, I need to go and check with this half million triangles. It's obviously very expensive. So one way to solve this problem, uh, okay, give me a second because someone is writing on the, okay. Is there a way to reverse ray trace to reduce blur or can you not unmake that soup? Okay, Russell, I, I don't, I think I don't understand what you mean by unmake that soup. Okay, keep, keep your, Keep your question, please. And yeah, let's talk about later about that. It's it sounds interesting, but yeah, but let's let's talk about that later. Okay, so uh, one option that is actually very nice is to um, to create bounding boxes around the objects, basically group the objects, and uh, and we can actually create like a hierarchy of bounding boxes. So for example, I create a I can create a bounding box for all these spheres, and I create a bounding box for the entire um, dragon and then I can create uh, more bounding boxes inside the original bounding box to basically group different areas of triangles of this super complicated model right and also to group different uh, spheres inside this group and basically what could happen is instead of having right like more than half million entities to check every time I shoot a ray I need to at first I need to only check if it's intersecting with two boxes, right? So this ray in particular is not intersecting with those two boxes, so it will be very cheap, right? I just need to check with two boxes. And that's it, it just goes directly to the background, gets the color of the background, and that's it. Uh, however, if I threw this ray here, and it gets, uh, it, it has an intersection with this box, then I, I can go uh, like inside its uh, hierarchy, and, and this is, uh, in the end, these are trees, right? So when you do this type of space partition or bounding box strategies using a hierarchy, uh, you're just creating a tree, right? I, I guess everybody already knows what, what tree is in computer science. So you get to the next net level, right? And net, now you need to check with 
these two bounded boxes, this one and this one, right? And you get the intersection. Now you realize that you are intersecting with this one, right? Well, okay, you, you go deeper, right? And now you can check with this one right here. And yeah, it turns out that you have an intersection, right? That there is an object inside. You check the intersection with the object and you get the intersection. And let's assume that in this case in particular, this sphere is, um, is not transparent and it doesn't have any ray tracing, uh, sorry, any um, refraction or, or, or a reflection. Um, well, basically, just getting to this intersection, you compute your bling or fong equation, define the color, and that's it. You finish, right? Basically, that's the end. So this is a good approximation for um, uh, accelerating ray tracing. The problem of this is that creating these bounding boxes is is also not as not as cheap, right? So whenever you are trying to come up with like an interesting idea of accelerating ray tracing, you need to you need to uh, check if your pre-processing technique is not in the end more expensive than uh, than the original one, right? So if if the object is is if you have objects like very very complicated like like this like the dragon, creating the creating the, the original bounding box if the bounding box is aligned with x and y axis which is this case. It's not as hard, right? But the way you need to segment, right? Makes like a segmentation of, of that super complex model into a smaller bounded boxes. And how do you decide which parts of the dragon are, right? Like are, are defined as like separated pieces and things like that. It can actually be a bit uh, complicated. And also if, uh, if you have a lot of objects in your scene, really a, a lot of objects it, this is this scene is very sparse right but you can have thousands of objects kind of in different places right it means that in the end you can you can even have almost almost uh almost the same amount of boxes than objects it, it could be that case right in, in some weird cases it could be that case so in the end it will be still very expensive because every ray right needs to check if any of those boxes are there so it will be okay i know this is this is cheaper right this ray in particular only needs to check if it's intersecting with this bounding box or this bounding box but the the ideal is to not check with any of those right so there's another there's another version and and let me see if there are questions we make these boxes after Okay, very good question. Do we make these boxes after rasterization or before? Well, rasterization is a different technique. If it's a different rendering technique. Remember that we are talking about ray tracing, right? So rasterization is the other the other way of creating a, a 3D uh, or computer graphics that is uh, using the rendering pipeline. Those are totally different things, right? So actually, the name of though that is is also called um, uh, rasterize uh, rasterize graphics or rasterization in, in in general. You're talking about real time rendering, right? So real time rendering uses rasterization. Ray tracing is totally different, but it's a very good question because I will show you pro yeah I will show you ne next lecture that we can actually use some sort of rasterization, a similar technique than rasterization to also help to uh, accelerate ray tracing. But yeah, in general, this is this is different. So um, conceptually speaking, there is no rasterization in ray tracing, right? Because that is another op 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 topic. And it's, uh, it, 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 okay, and you're saying, I imagine that it might be cheaper if we do that. Yes, exactly. You're saying, imagine that it may be cheaper if we do it after rasterization, but I, I wouldn't know if uh, ray tracing still works. Uh, yeah, you're, Oh my God! Yeah, very, very, very good uh, question because yeah, you're basically kind of spoiling already something that it, it will be interesting. Yes, we can use rasterization techniques to no, 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 don't don't say sorry. No, no, that, that is actually very, very good, very, very good. Uh, yeah, but you will see, you will see. Very, very good, very good question. Uh, okay, so let's keep talking about a, a space partition. So another, another, another way to solve this problem, and this is a. Uh, this is a, a very common way to do it and very simple to, to implement, actually. It's uh, basically uh, to 
to uh, segment my space, like like voxelize the space, right? In 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 uh, cubes, right? So and usually the the best way to do it is to first to, to have also like a hierarchy. So basically you 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 you, um, you segmented your space in, in a grid, right? And you can modify the, the size of the grid using a certain hierarchy. So in this case, imagine that we, we first take the entire space and we just segmented this space in six squares, right? Six very, very large squares. And in, in um, usually, if you implement this, for example, usually what, what, what you would do is to segment your, your entire sp your space in basically eight uh, boxes, right? It's like you take the entire space as a box, as a big box, and you just cut half, 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 and you will have uh, four boxes on, on, on the bottom, four boxes on the top, and you basically have something exactly, octrees, exactly. It, this is basically an octree, right? In this case, let's assume that we just segment this thing in six pieces. So the thing here is you just need to check if your ray is basically intersecting with those boxes or not, right? So if you have everything as an octree and you're sending a ray and you're not intersecting with, with with one of those big boxes, okay, that's perfectly fine. You just get the background and that's it. If you intersect with one of those uh, boxes, well, you go, again, deeper, right? Or go uh, deeper on, on the segmentation. Let's, let's, for now, imagine that we have only two steps in this segmentation. So now this is the second step of the segmentation. And instead of having six uh, boxes, we have a lot of boxes. And in, that, in, in, in this example then, uh, I need an algorithm to somehow make this ray and get this ray like walk, right? Walk through the space, checking if, if it's checking with which boxes is intersecting. And because each box has a, a list of objects that are inside that box, right? Basically, if you get into this box in particular, eventually, I mean, if the boxes are empty, that's perfectly fine. You just keep walking, right? But your ray is walking and eventually gets into a box that is intersecting and it, that, that it, it does have an object inside. Okay, then you check if you're intersecting with that object. It turns out that you do. You take the, the, the intersection, you compute the color, and that's it. It's finished. The question is, how do we achieve this, right? So the first thing you need is you need to you need to compute a ray uh, box intersection, right? So you somehow again for every box or every square here you need to compute these intersections. So let's see how how we can do this. Uh, before, do you have any questions? I mean, I'm still seeing very high level stuff. Okay, good. So let's see what can we do. Okay, so let's talk about ray box intersection. We already check ray sphere intersection, uh, ray plane intersection, ray triangle intersection. So let's talk about ray box intersection. So we have a ray um, um, uh, that has an origin. I'm calling the origin. I'm calling. I'm calling the origin as R, and we have a box. And I have obviously the coordinates of ray. Right? I have x, y, z coordinates for this guy. And I obviously have also the direction. I'm not showing the arrow, right? But imagine that I have a, an arrow, and obviously that is the intersection, the, the direction of my ray. And I have also the coordinates of my box, right? So for every box, you usually only need two, um, two coordinates, right? The min and the max that are basically opposite corners from that box. In this case, everything is 2D, so they're just opposite corners of this square. And so again, obviously mean and max, you have x, y coordinates, x, y coordinates for max. So what do you think? What do you think would be a good strategy to compute the intersection between this ray and this box with the information you already, you already have? Okay, someone is saying reduce to ray triangle intersection by triangulating box. Yes, that is actually a, a good strategy, a strategy, a valid strategy, right? In the end, a box, it can be described, right, with 12 triangles, right? And yeah, I can use those triangles. And remember, ray, tri ray triangle intersection is actually split into, into pieces. You first intersect with a plane, and then you check if that intersection in that plane is actually inside a triangle or not. So that is one option. 
The thing is, that option is still very expensive. Uh, so it's not, it's not the, rest, the best solution. Okay, so David is saying a six ray plane intersection. That is a bit cheaper, of course. So if instead of computing as triangles, right, you get rid of all the barycentric coordinates things, and you could maybe say, okay, let's compute, right, just if it's intersecting with these planes. So using ray plane intersection, that is actually, yeah, also a valid idea, a good idea. Uh, in this case, it's only four, right? I mean, everything right here is only is, is 2D. So in that case, I, I would have basically four planes, right? And I could see if I am basically, uh, yeah, if I have an intersection with any of those four planes. And we already have the equations for ray plane intersection. That is on on, on a previous lecture, and um, and we already talked about that, right? Well, it turns out that computing that that way, computing a, a six plane intersections, or in this case, four four plane intersections, is still very expensive. So there is a better way. So and and again, I what I sh I will show you is a pure geometrical algorithm that, in my personal opinion, is one of the most beautiful algorithms in computer graphics. I absolutely love these things. It's very, very simple and elegant. Okay, so the way we will perform the computation is by checking the intersection between the ray with the ranges of this box, its ranges in X and Y coordinates. So the, the thing is, in the end, this box is not a, it's not a box, it's not any box in space. This box belongs to a grid, right? And that grid is obviously regular. That is super important, right? The grid is obviously regular. It means that this distance right here is obviously the same as this distance, and this distance is the same as this distance, right? So because it, yeah, it is a grid. So the range of the, uh, the range of this box in the y coordinate is this basically this uh, area right here, right? This is the uh, the range in y coordinates, and this is its range in x coordinates. So instead of computing directly the intersection, the actual intersections, I mean, this one and this one from the box, I would first get the intersection of the ray with these planes, with the planes that are defining the range of this guy in X and Y coordinates. So in order to do that, I will see the problem. I will see the ray, not as an infinite ray, but as, um, as a straight line, okay? So remember, I have R, which is the origin of the ray, and I, we have the direction, right? So if we just multiply a ray by a very large number, right, and, and by a distance that we know it's farther from my uh, far plane, right, it's basically outside the entire space I'm computing, I will get something like this. But, so R prime, again, it's a very far point that is just defining this vector, right? In this case in particular, it's, it's kind of inside the space, but imagine that it's just very far. So having this, what I need to compute is now the intersection between this line, r prime, r prime minus r, basically that vector, and this plane right here, right? And again, some of you might think, okay, well, we, we have that algorithm already, right? We have an algorithm uh, that having a segment and having a plane with a normal and a point in that in that plane, we can get the intersection, right? We, you actually use the that to compute the clipping. Remember, clipping is exactly that. You have this could be this could be one of the planes of the clipping. This could be one of the clipping planes, and this could be basically one of those segments, right? So yeah, why not using that? Well, the thing is, it is even easier than that because again, remember this box is part of a grid and you have the coordinates of everything and these uh, distances are basically the same for everything and in the end this the real normal of these planes are super easy right the normal of this plane right here is just zero one zero right everything else is zero the normals of this the normal of this guy right here right is some arrow pointing in this direction is basically one zero zero okay so what we do is we will solve the problem using only one dimension. Because again, this seems like, okay, in 3D, it seems a bit complicated. Well, we just 
simplify everything in just one dimension. So let, let's let's uh, see what happens. Just checking only the y dimension, the vertical dimension. So let's uh, get the basically the values from r prime and r on the y value on the y coordinate. Basically, it's this line, right? So having that line, the intersection that we are looking for is basically this vector right here, r prime minus r, multiplied by some factor, by some scale, right? So this this will be basically the scale. The scale is basically the radi the ratio between this distance a, uppercase a, divided by the entire distance from r prime to r. Do you agree with that? And somebody saying, can what I did for bounding box actually? Yes. Yeah. Maybe you already used this thing. And so basically, k it's uh, sorry. So. We are looking for this ratio, right? So the thing is, because everything here is so simple, right? The geometry here is very simple. This ratio, the ratio between this distance and the larger distance, is basically the same as the ratio between A and this larger distance, right? Which is this. Basically, the distance A divided by the difference in Y coordinates between R prime and R, right? It's super simple. It's very, very uh, cheap, right? And obviously the distance a is just the y coordinate of the min point minus the y the y coordinate of the r point, which is the origin of, of our ray, and obviously the absolute value, and that's it, right? So basically that's k, and then you can get this intersection, the absolute value. Yes. Uh, why isn't l on the box instead? Oh, okay. You will see why. So someone is asking why, why the intersection is not in the box. You will see why. So we are not getting the intersection with the box. We are getting the intersection with the planes that define the range of the box in y coordinates and x coordinates. So please uh, calm. <laughs> I will get there. Okay. So computing this intersection, as you can see, it's incredibly, incredibly cheap. Right? Super, super cheap. So, using exactly the same strategy, um, we can get the other intersection, right? Basically, the same strategy is very, very, very cheap. So now we get basically the intersection between the rays, sorry, the ray, and the two planes that are defining the range in y coordinates of this box, right? And again, using a very similar strategy because at the end, it will be very similar. Geometrically speaking, it's very similar and very uh, cheap. Now we get the intersection of the ray with now the planes that are defining, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, the planes that are defining the x range or the range of this box in x coordinates. So we get the, the green points, right? So the blue points are the coordinates of the intersection with coordinates of y and the green points are the coordinates of x. So let's see what, what we have. Once you have those, uh, you basically have the intersection, again, the intersection between the ray and the y range, which is the blue line. And if you only get the x coordinates of basically that range or the x coordinates of those intersections, you get this line. You agree? This line basically represents only the x component of these points right here, this intersection, that, that they were super easy to get. And you can do basically the same with the ones in green, right? So this is the green line, and only the x component is these things right here. So these are called the intervals. So these are, this is the interval of y from this, from this ray in particular, if it's its interval in y coordinates with respect to the box. And this one is the interval in, sorry, in what, sorry, the blue one is in y coordinates and the green one is in x coordinates with respect to the box, right? So it turns out that if these intervals basically intersect, which is also very simple to test because you can, you have this intersection, you just check if the x value of this intersection is larger than the initial value, the initial intersection from the next interval, right? So you just check if they overlap. 
So if they overlap, it turns out that your array is actually intersecting with the box. If they are not uh, overlapping, if you have an array that is not intersecting with the box, once you compute those things, right, and you get the x components and you compare them, well, it turns out that they are not overlapping, so it turns out that the array is not touching the, or is not um, getting into the into the box. I don't know about you, but I, I just love this idea. It's very, very elegant, and it's incredibly cheap. Uh, questions? So I guess, I guess, Paul, is, is it clear why we were computing first with the planes and not directly to the box? Yeah, hey, great. Yeah, it's very cool, right? I mean, yeah, I just get very excited with this. <laughs> okay, so now we have this beautiful algorithm, right? Uh, okay, so Zerora, someone is asking, sorry, can you go over the previous slide again? Yes, this one. How was k calculated again? Okay, okay, wait. Okay, wait, wait a minute. So k is basically the ratio of this distance is a over this entire distance, right? Which is this, basically the, the difference in y uh, coordinate between r prime and r, right? That is that is the ratio. And why that ratio is, is um, is the one we want well because because this is a right right triangle right the ratio between this distance and the distance between r and r prime will be that ratio will be exactly the same as k right so this is how we calculated k okay so again now we have a super 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 um, elegant and very very fast algorithm to compute uh, the intersection between ray and, 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 and cubes, right? Well, again, I mean, this, this were squares, but obviously the, you just um, add the x coordinate and it will be basically the same. So now we return to the space partition and great. Now we have, we have a way to compute. We have this ray and we have a way to compute if, if my ray is basically um, colliding with this box, right? So let's imagine for a moment that we just are checking with the first the first uh, section of boxes, right? If my ray is intersecting with those. And I find out that it's intersecting with this one in particular. Okay, so the thing is I go and check the information I, I have from that box in particular. And it turns out that the box is empty, so I need to keep walking, right? So again, this, this uh, strategy is kind of like getting my ray to walk right to make take steps so the now the next step is basically now i need to to get now the the new intersections right the next intersections and we could say well okay it's fine we have an algorithm that is still have um that is is very cheap right to compute the ray and and, and, and the box uh, but the thing is look at this we need to we will apply something that is called incremental intersection. The thing is, again, remember that we are we are getting the intersection between the ray and the boxes, but not as we are not seeing this this intersection as the ray and the boxes, but the ray and the planes are defining their ranges, right? Their planes defining their ranges in x and y. So if we separate all those intersections, right? If we separate the vertical ones and the horizontal ones we can see that there is obviously a clear pattern, right? Because the grid is regular, because these, distance are, these distances are always the same, and obviously the, the ray is a straight line and it's not bending or anything like that, right? The distance, uh, distance between these intersections, between the x, uh, the rays, the, sorry, the, between the planes that are defining the x range, these distances are obviously the same, right? There is a pattern. So, if I have that pattern, I can use, and this obviously will uh, create a uh, right triangle using Pythagoras, because I have also, I have this distance, right? This distance is basically the size of my boxes. So I have this distance, I have this distance, right? So I can, I can get this distance right here. So having this distance, computing the next intersection is even cheaper. I don't even need to compute K again, right? I just need to literally, right? I, I can get this coordinate just by adding this 
in x coordinate another in this in y coordinate right so i just get the la the last intersection and i just increment my values right and that's it that's why it's called incremental intersection because you don't need to do you need to do anything else you just add those numbers because you already know those numbers and that's it so this is where this is how you can just get the next intersection right it is mind blown yes it's mind blown right super 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 cheap so again using exactly the same strategy we can do the same for now the x sorry with the i uh, the y range right because it, it will be the same these intersections will have exactly the same distance right because everything is regular now uh it means that the distance from this point to this point will be exactly the same as the distance from this point to this point so yeah if i am here and i need to compute now the next intersection i just add the distance i am already know and i just add the size of my box and that's it i get to this intersection right so it is super super fast getting the next the next intersections is very fast so now let's see i have i have my ray i'm already hit my ray with this first with the first box perfect great i have the intersections i have now an algorithm that can compute the next intersections very easy right very easily the thing is how how can I know which box I need to check, right? Because somehow it's, yeah, I can get the intersections, but that, but, I, but still I need to, I need to see, I need to get like, which is the box that I need to check, right? Um, so the trick here, this is, and this is also very interesting is look at the position of the next, the final intersection on, on this, in this uh, box right here. This is my intersection, right? So if the intersection if the x component of the intersection is exactly on the limit between the boxes, and that you, it's very easy to, to know that because you have all those coordinates, right? If it's exactly there, it means that you need to only move to the right, right? So you just make a step or a walk to the right. Now you, right, and you obviously compute the next, you can very easily compute the next uh, intersection. So because the next intersection, it's x component it is still on the limit of the boxes good you just take a step to the right here same happens it is still the intersection it is still exactly on the, on x, x component it is exactly on, the, on this plane so we get a step on the right now we get the new intersection right and this intersection is different the x component of is this intersection is not exactly at the limit between those boxes, but it's actually a value that is uh, um, uh, smaller than that, right? So if it's smaller than that, it means that I cannot walk forward. I either can walk right to up or down, right? So how can I know if I need to walk up, up, up or down? Just by checking the y component, right? So if the y component will be in this uh, limit, it means that I need to go up. If if it was, for example, the intersection were, were here, I just need to go down, right? So in this case, I just, sorry, I go up, then my intersection is here, the x component is exactly on the limit, I go to the right, I go to right, right again, and now I get into a box that has an object inside, is not empty, and says, okay, I have an object inside, is this sphere, I get my ray, and check the intersection between the sphere and the ray, and I get the intersection, I get the color, and that's it. <laughs> and the rate stops, and that's it, right? So, how cool is this? And someone is asking, this, is, this seems just like the line scan algorithm. Yes, it is exactly the same, actually. Um, but, but, but it's not, it's not line scan, it's a scan line. But yeah, exactly. This is exactly the same algorithm that we use to compute the scanline algorithm. I don't know if you remember, but when we were uh, checking uh, the scanline algorithm, I told you that if you had time, it would be nice if you could uh, check the stepping algorithm. And I, I put it like, a, like a, a, a web link, right, for to a video, I think. And uh, yeah, so if, if some of you check that that uh, that link, this is exactly what we do in, 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 um, in rasterization if we do a scanline. Uh, yeah, this is basically what we do to to go like getting getting all the the, the, the pixels right. Okay, and 
And so many, is this used for a space partition? Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, the entire thing that, I've, that I'm explaining is a space partition, yes. Uh, remember, these are not pixels, right? These are uh, cubes in, in space. These are, I, I am, uh, yes, of course, segmenting the space in these cubes, and I'm just getting my ray to walk, right, on this area. So if you, imp obviously, I mean, these algorithms are very nice, they're very cool. Implementing these algorithms, it is, Easy, yeah, it's some sort of easy thing. Uh, in the end, in practice, obviously, there are like a lot of ifs and else and things like that, right? I mean, it's, it's not like, I mean, you cannot implement this in five, like five minutes or something like that. I mean, it, it takes time, right, to check everything. But um, but in, in terms of math and, and in terms of logic, it's really, really nice. And it works impressively, impressively nice. Uh, and it, it can reduce the amount of, of the speed for a ray tracer immensely, right? Because in the end, if, if a ray is basically on a specific direction in which there are basically no objects, the, the computation of, uh, yeah, of basically knowing that there are, there, there's nothing there and you're, you're basically intersecting just empty boxes is super fast. Okay, and how would this speed up the ray tracing? Well, again, uh, the way it is speed ups the ray tracing is if you're not doing this, you basically, for every ray trace you send, for example, here you have five boxes and half a million triangles in this dragon, right? So if you're not using this strategy, for every ray you send, you need to check if your ray is intersecting with half a million triangles plus five spheres for every new ray you send that is incredibly expensive but in this case because you're using this space partition only the rays that are basically getting into this area in particular only for those you will compute the intersections right and of course um, as i said this needs to be also a hierarchy of grids right so the best way to to do it for example in, in the case of the dragon is you need to um you need to have maybe uh like more steps right to decrease the, the size of the boxes, right? To, to basically have a, a tighter grid to, to this object, right? So in that, that, that case, you, you, evil, you even um, uh, have a, a very nice economy of uh, ray, ray triangles intersection because only, only some, of, some of those triangles from the, from the dragon will get inside this, probably to very small boxes, right? Uh, okay, we need to end here because you need to now take time to answer the student evaluation of teaching. Uh, yeah, the department as, is asking me to, yeah, you basically need to, you need to, to take time on the class. So let me see. So yeah, please go. <laughs> yeah, I know I, I, we want to learn. Yeah, I know, but we need to do this. <laughs> we need to do this and I need to, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm obligated. It's mandatory for me to give you time. So, okay, so David is asking a question. I, I will probably um, uh, answer a couple of questions, but yeah, please go check your email. I don't have the link, so please, you should have received an, a, a link. So I don't have it. So it should be on your, on your email. So go check your email, get the link, and we have time right now. We have fif basically 15 minutes to answer. Okay, so yes. We have a question from David. Then check. Uh, yes. Um, can you go to the slides that first says like space partition? It's uh, a bit earlier. Yeah. This one. Uh, yeah. Uh, one slide before. Yeah. Before. Oh. Uh. Uh. Wait. Uh. Actually, Way before. One slide after. No, no. One slide after that. After. After. After after this, this one. Uh, wait. Oh, actually, wait before. Very okay. Like, no uh, yeah, before the boxing curtain section. This one. This one. Uh, yes, one one before that. Yes, yes. Okay. So here you have the larger boxes, yeah. right? But in the next slides, you have smaller boxes. Yes. Do we slice boxes during space partition? Yes. So a space partition, I mean, it, it's it's that is obviously optional, right? You could define. Your, your... When do we uh, like like because uh, because uh, I didn't see you slice any box later, so I'm not sure. Like when do we slice box? 
boxes. Okay, okay. So the space partition or the slicing of your space needs to happen before the rendering, right? So it's like it's like, it's this uh, pre-process. It's a very good question because it depends on it depends on the size of your objects and it also depends on the density of your objects. There are also many algorithms to help you to actually define that. Uh, so it, it's also it's not it's not mandatory to create a hierarchy of grids. You could define a single grid, right? Say, okay, I will partition my my entire world with bo with boxes or cubes of I don't know two by two by two units. You you could do that, right? Of course, yeah. the uh, the per the performance of your solution will depend on on how much those boxes are covering the objects, right? So if the objects are very large or very small or very dense or whatever, you will have different different uh, behavior. So if you want to make this like super, super efficient, what you usually do is you take your entire space, you first part, uh, segment your space in um, in eight, box, eight cubes, right? And, and it will be basically an up tree. And then you can have different levels of grids, right? So you can eventually separate one of one of uh, each of those boxes you segment it again in eight and then another eight whatever when do you need to stop again depends right you for example you could have you could have an algorithm that maybe you could say okay i will keep i will keep segmenting my, my space adding more resolution to my grid until my i don't know until my cubes are just a bit larger than the smaller triangle, right? And maybe that that that, that is where you stop. Or you maybe say, okay, no, I mean, I I, I will ju just have like three levels or things like that. But again, this depend that depends on many many factors. Depends on your, uh, on your like side. how would that affect anything? If I have like super small boxes, it's like if if uh, if uh, again depends on on, on your objects, rates. right? So if if you have just a few a few objects, right, and you somehow segment, you have I don't know, like, let let's exaggerate, and you have ten levels of segmenting, and you have super super tiny boxes, you will spend a lot of time, right, checking all those mm -hmm. levels, all those levels, until you finally get into a valid intersection. So that will be maybe w even worse than 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 not having this space partition, right. Uh, however, if you have again, if you have, you have a lot of triangles. If you have objects with very, very, very high density, uh, with millions of millions of triangles, in those cases, having very small, uh, uh, several levels of grading, of grids, sorry, with with uh, very small cubes, in those cases, maybe it's it's better. But again, that is something that is 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 hard to define, but it depends on your on your scene, right? Uh, I will show you a different. This is one way of doing space partition. I will show you a different way to to perform a space partition in the next next lecture. Then instead of using a regular grid, you can also do space partition with non regular grids. That is different. Mm -hmm. So if your objects basically what happens is is kind of adaptive. So if you if you if you really need to get into smaller volumes or smaller cubes. Your algorithm will basically do that, and you use you use that with KD trees, but we will see that uh, on on the next lecture, right? Okay. Good. Okay. So, so for this space partition, so you first perform a um, ray bo a weight ray box check to get the distance difference between x and y, uh, x's and y y's. Yeah. And then you basically extend that by doing the increment mm -hmm. intersection. Yeah. yeah. But when do you do the slicing box part? Oh, do you do it after? Before, no, but before that. The, the slicing is, it needs that. to be before, yeah. So once you are already checking the intersection between your ray and those boxes, those boxes need to exist already, right? So the, the partition of the space needs to happen before rendering. It's a pre-process. So you take your entire okay. scene, you pre-process but, your scene, you define those boxes. Because the uh -huh. thing is, you also need to define which objects belong to which boxes, right? Which yeah, sphere, I, I right? That. So that needs to happen it's... before the rendering, right? So once that is finished, then you, you make your way to walk, right? With using these yeah. increments and things like that. 
yeah, but uh, but I I feel like if you do a pre like pre process everything, you don't know how many boxes, how small the boxes should be. Uh, like what's the size? Uh, again, the boxes? It, you can define it in in different ways. You can oh, define you just it. Do ten? You just do ten levels? Like just do well ten level ten, 10 levels ten levels is is a lot. No, no, no. Again, again yeah, the way you that. you usually the way you usually can define it is depending on the size of your objects, mm-hmm. right? So, for example, if, okay. let's talk. Let's imagine that this is just spheres, implicit spheres. So you just take a guess. You just, you take, just a take a guess. guess. Take a guess. guess. So okay. let's say let's nice. say that you are just uh, taking uh, spheres, for example, and you know that your spheres are. I mean, you have different sizes of spheres. Maybe you could say, okay, I will partition my my space until the cubes are a bit larger than the average uh, the average sphere, and that's it. Right? Or if okay, you I'm have a guess. way more complex scene that is made out of, out of triangles. You can define depending on the size of the triangles, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank Good. you. Okay, so the next, sorry, the the rest of people, I, yeah, please, I I assume you're answering the evaluation, which I really appreciate if you're doing that. Uh, Okay, so someone is asking, are the positions of the objects defined on the grid beforehand? Yes, that is what I, I was saying, right? So the positions of the objects, basically the, be, yeah, like which objects belong to which cube or to, to which uh, uh, box, uh, it needs to be defined before, before rendering. Yeah, actually, depending, so for example, in 3 Studio Max, if you have a very large scene, uh, sometimes when you hit render, you can see that the render engine, the render engine has uh, has logs, right? It is telling you, like, what is exactly the process in which the render is, is doing. And uh, if, if, the, if the, the scene, for example, is very large, sometimes you can, you can see the logs saying, like, pre-processing the scene. Pre-processing the scene is usually the, is performing the space partition. So if the large is very is very large, it, it takes enough time for you to actually see the the like the lock saying, oh I'm 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 preparing the objects. Okay, Mark has a question. Hi. Um yes, uh, I'm just curious about um, the R prime in one of the previous slides. I'm just wondering is there an optimized way of calculating it or uh, did I miss something in how uh, Mathematically, it's automatically determined. Uh, you okay? You want you want to know how to compute R prime? Yes. Okay. Good question. Yeah, because I didn't add it. I, I just mentioned, but I didn't add it to the equations. So the thing is, what you have originally, you have the origin of your ray, right? Which is R, and you also have the direction of your ray, right? You have the origin and the direction. Both are vectors, right? So yeah. you basically take the origin, sorry, the the direction of your ray, you multiply that direction by a very large number. But that that very large number will be basically this distance, right? Okay. And then you add R, and you, you will get R prime. So R prime will be basically R times a very large distance plus R. So in the choice of this very large distance, is it arbitrary, or do we like pick the max integer? And very good question. Uh, so again, you the way okay. So this segment, this right, this large segment between r prime and r, we just need it to be large enough to cover the entire space. So remember that you we usually in, in computer graphics we usually define the, a near plane and also a far plane. That is that happens when we are. Uh, computing real-time rate, real-time um, rendering, but also we can define it in in, in, um, in um, ray tracing, right? So in the end, you have, you have, you know where your ob- you, you know the coordinates of your objects, right? So for example, imagine that you take your, your entire scene, you have all the coordinates for all the objects, you have the coordinates for all your lights and everything. You can compute a bounding box for your entire objects, your entire scene, that bounding box, right, basically represents the entire space in which your scene is inside, right? So that distance 
right? The distance in which I need to project R prime because R prime is basically a projection of R, right? It's just like getting this the original vector and just projecting like very, very far. Right. So that, that distance uh, usually needs to be uh, just large, larger than than your entire scene, right? So, for example, one very good rule of thumb is you compute the bounding box for your entire scene. You get the diagonal of the diagonal of that of that um, of that bounding box, right? That that diagonal is already a distance that is basically covering your entire scene, and you can even make, maybe just multiply by two. So you basically get your ray. You multiply by twice the diagonal of the bounding box of your entire scene, and R will be far enough, right, to, to do these computations. Because it just needs to be very far. How far? Yeah, there, you can use that. Are there specific uh, uh, methods by which we calculate the bounding box uh, in the previous lecture? I can't remember now. Oh, no, 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 very good question. We haven't defined it, but it's, oh yeah, I, 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 haven't, I haven't said that. Okay, uh, well, I haven't said that, yeah, very good. Uh, thanks for catching that. But it's actually very straightforward. So uh, the 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 align axis align bounding box is just defined. Imagine I have objects here, right? And 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 imagine that this square is basically the bounding box of of these objects. The way you compute the bounding box is just by taking the minimal the minimum uh, coordinate in x, the maximum coordinate in x, the minimum in y, and the maximum in y. That's that's that is the way you define a bounding box, but yeah, it's a good question. I I mean I don't have much more time right now to maybe draw something, but I will I will explain that on the next lecture. Thanks. Okay, so just think quickly then. It's just a matter of iterating over all the coordinates and picking yeah. the minimum and yes, the, the minimum, minimum and maximum exactly. Minimum. You get the minimum the min the min x max x mean y max y, and that basically defines your your bounding box. So for example here. You can you could see this as a, a as a bounding box in two D. Basically, this mean has the minimum x and the minimum y, right? And this corner right here has the maximum y and the maximum x. So in three D, a bounding box has also two opposite corners. One is the mean, uh, the minimum x, y, and z from every corner. So for for uh, from every coordinate, and the opposite corner is the maximum x, y, and z, right? Okay. Oh, thank you you're welcome okay so we need to finish um uh and again yeah i i obviously uh, a lot of people is maybe need to maybe need, they need to leave so if you answer the evaluation thank you so much if you haven't uh, done it uh please yeah please do it maybe if 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 not a lot of people have done this on the next lecture i will also probably need to give more time Thank you so much. I will see you on what day is today? <laughs> Friday, right? Yes, I will see you on Friday. Thank you. Bye, everybody.